Hi all, for our notable game today, let's revisit the amazing encounter between Gary Kasparov, who was 2831 at the time, and the up and coming Magnus Carlsen, who was an IM at the time of 2484. This was in 2004 in the Reykjavik Rapid. Now, the time control uh, was something like 25 minutes with five second increments, I believe. And we have Gary Kasparov kicking off with the English opening so c4 Magnus Carlsen plays knight f6 after knight c3 we have g6 and now we get a transposition into the king's engine defense e4 d6 d4 bishop g7 knight f3 castles bishop e2 e5 and here the most common move the classical move is the castle the second most popular is bishop e3. It's provoking black to try and kick the knight as a dancing knight variation, which can go like this. Knight g4, which wasn't played, is very, very popular here. For example, bishop g5, f6, bishop h4, and the game could continue like this, with the knight's coming back. So it's coming back here. And it's getting that f7 square quite a common sequence but in this game slightly risky in some respects slightly less popular is e takes d4 and this is what magnus carlson chose its drawback is it might actually soften black's pawn structure if ever black plays c6 this d pawn might be slightly fragile on the other hand it promises some counts play along the e file with some pressure on e4. Gary Sparov, he took on d4. And in this position, one of the more common moves is actually rook e8, with the idea of trying to play for c6 and d5. The move order here is very interesting, actually. Magnus chose the slightly rarer move order, c6. But it transposes quickly f3 and now rook e8 f3 is such a logical move to try and stabilize that e-file pressure but here's a very very clever move which is what i would consider by a recent definition i mentioned on reddit as an accurate move i indicated you can get a contrast of what an accurate move means in the in the run of uh, commentary quite often with the typical castling move. So here, a typical move would be castling, and many of us would just castle here. It's stereotypical. But sometimes a more accurate move, I mentioned, might be available, which forces a concession or something, and then castling later. The more accurate move fits into the nuances of the position, which make the position slightly more special, the warranting the bog standard stereotypical move. And I mentioned, you know, synonyms, you know, clinical move, perfect move, technical move, nuanced move, best move, strong, strongest or specific or correct. Now here, yeah, most of us would just castle back Sparov. Even in this rapid encounter, he chose bishop f2. This also, by the way, is the most theoretical move. It's stepping out of the way of d5, this pin against the bishop. So instead of routinely castling, it gives white subtly some more options now against this d5 d5 is played here in this position if black doesn't play d5 another move in line is a6 but it seems this position is slightly uh favorable for white a bind on that deep on the deep one slightly vulnerable here so black um is trying to play actively in this game and plays d5 immediately, actually. And it's still quite a theoretically uh, trodden path. e takes d5. c takes d5. And white now plays c5. This gives a 3 to 2 pawn majority on the queen side. And it isolates, of course, black's queen's pawn. Knight c6. And now white castles. 
Now, a very aggressive knight h5, which is well known as well. And it's important here to see that black, if he plays knight f4, this gets to be very dangerous. Because then there's things like queen g5. And also, of course, the knight is bearing down on e2. So things like knight takes d4. And getting the queen away from e2 is going to win a piece potentially. So white against knight f4 plays queen d2. So for the moment, a well known position, in fact, is black's pawn giving enough compensation here. Bishop e5 is played. And now black might be playing for not queen h4, but because the bishop's gone in h4, but knight f4 and then queen h4 or queen g5 later. If the bishop moved, then queen h4, but queen g5 after knight f4. So g3 stops knight f4. And here, usually, black plays knight g7, reserving the possibility of this bishop coming to e6, actually, because this pawn's slightly vulnerable. So yeah, the most trodden path, 120 games in live book, are with knight g7 here. As an example, just to test this d-pawn, say this, bishop e6. And here, it's thought to be about equal, funny enough, this position. If white takes on e6, black could uh, take with this knight. And this position, bishop takes c3, gives black, it seems, some compensation. And it's thought to be about equal. So that's very interesting. But in this game, Magnus chooses off the g3, a rare, a rarer choice, bishop h3. Although it's a tempo gain on the rook, the rook now goes to quite a useful square. You might think logically it should go to d1, right? But it actually goes to e1, another little subtlety here. Perhaps it's usefully guarding e2, and this rook can actually go later to d5. We see now in this position knight g7. And in fact, yes, the other rook for d5 pressure. All it needs is for this knight to move and then d5 is hit. But of course black does seem to have the possibility potentially of playing for d4. Here rook c8 was played. And this doesn't seem to help black's isolated d pawn. Other choices are interesting to consider here. Just wasting the tempo basically bishop e6 just to protect d5. This possibility seems okay if taking like this. Although white might be slightly better, it might be okay for black. Uh, also, instead of rook c8, we can have a look at knight e6. And if here, then we've got d4, so supported by both knights and the queen. And if here, knight e4, a6, this position, actually, there's some fireworks here at black's disposal. And knight takes c5, trying to undermine that adventurous knight. And we can get a position with desperados, a crazy sequence like this, could end up being about equal. So that was interesting to consider as well, just tactically. Knight e6 here. Also, I mean a6 simply just to stop knight b5. This this possibility. But sacking the d pawn seems crazy. But again, black might have some counterplay potentially in this position and threatens to shatter white's pawn structure with bishop taking c3. So this position is also kind of interesting to consider. But in the game, yeah, rook c8 didn't seem to do much for the d pawn. We have knight db5, so hitting the d pawn. But Magnus kicks the knight first. 
knight d6 forking the rooks it's taken but in taking black's dark square weaknesses may be more exploitable now c takes d6 if now queen takes d6 then knight takes d5 is really quite good for white there's a threat of even g4 and knight f4 to win this bishop in the game Mengs chose d4 but yeah just to check this again queen takes d6 this position say knight e7 say then knight takes e7 queen takes e7 there's bishop b5 here nasty and in this position if also we consider rook e5 then f4 this position is very pleasant for white and if queen b8 then there's knight f6 check just forking the rook and king so in the game yeah d4 not taking that form knight e4 and yes the knight's eyeing the f6 square and it seems at the moment as though there's no problem at the moment with these dark squares around Magnus Carlsen's king and he plays bishop f5 hoping to just snap this knight off but a brilliant tactical finesse now is played white play can you guess what white plays in this position which doesn't give Magnus Carlsen time to take this knight and starts to expose in fact the dark square weaknesses around black's king so a tactical finesse if i give you five seconds what would you play in this position okay d7 yes nasty if queen takes then we have knight f6 check ouch so the bishop is lured to d7 otherwise we're just forking the rooks we're going to take one of the rooks but here unfortunately bishop takes d4 and now we've got two pieces coordinating on f6 this f6 square is a big problem black snaps off this bishop what else if he plays something like knight h5 trying to defend f6 then the bishop can drop back here and the queen's ready for queen h6 so for example bishop moves out of the firing line of queen takes d7 then there's queen h6 and this is really miserable for black this position looking at the queen looking at things like knight g5 this is just unbearable the pressure around black's king side so basically magnus he snapped off this bishop but now we've still got two pieces the queen and the knight looking at f6 to fork and we're also looking at queen takes d7 as well Magnus is in big big trouble here he lets a piece go what else it's very very difficult this position he plays knight f5 so we have queen takes d7 check and the idea is at least to try and get a pawn over here this b2 pawn so queen a4 rook takes queen takes queen takes b2 but now a strong move trying to simplify queen b1 black is a piece down queen takes b2 bishop c4 protecting a2 now threatening f3 just rookie three and here magnus threw in the towel he's a piece down it seems fairly lost without too much counterplay a very interesting encounter so it shows an interesting line in the king's engine instead of the main line classical line um, we have bishop e3 early on and uh, 
black tries to break the position up with c6 and d5 it left a slightly vulnerable d pawn maybe a subtle error was bishop h3 instead of trying to lend support immediately for the d5 pawn which seems more theoretically trodden just putting the bishop on e6 and it seems at the very moment that there wasn't going to be a problem around the dark squares there was because of d7 so after this this knight was about to be satisfied we have d7 that was just a, a crunching decisive blow to gain a big advantage based on the dark squares around black's king so Kasparov's timely tactical finesses had spelled disaster for the black position in this game okay i hope you got something out of it comments or questions on youtube thanks very much